everybody. Uh, we want to welcome you to uh, our event tonight, COVID-2021, The Experts Answer Your Questions. Uh, a couple huge programming notes here. So the first thing uh, we want to make sure everybody does is to choose an audio channel. Uh, there's an option for English and there is an option for Spanish. Uh, this is very important that you do this so that you're not hearing things in both languages as we have the discussion. If we're okay along those lines, uh, we're going to move on now. Uh, this event tonight is a, is a huge undertaking uh, brought to you by our entire news team and all of you as readers. We know there are going to be some questions and we've compiled a lot of questions in advance. Tonight, if you have questions, please place them in the Q&A section, not the chat section, but in the Q&A section. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So we haven't uh, activated the setting yet. So that's one reason why you don't see um, that option yet. I will give the same instructions in Spanish for those people who are joining us in Spanish. Muy buenas noches a todos y a todas. Eh, este evento, bienvenidos a este evento de hoy eh, presentado por Lookout Santa Cruz, el cual se llama el Lookout en el año 2021. Los expertos contestan a sus preguntas. Eh, vamos a activar la configuración de interpretación. Una vez activado, usted podrá ver un icono de un globito o de un mundo al lado de los demás botones abajo en la barra inferior de Zoom. Ahí podrá escoger español y así podrá escucharnos. So for everyone else out there, we are about to activate this language interpretation setting and immediately after that, you will see a new icon appearing next to um, one of the icons that you have at the bottom of your, of, of your screen. So we can go ahead and activate the setting now. Okay, I think we are good to proceed. Apologies on my end about that. Um, if you have questions tonight, please be sure to put them in the Q&A section, not the chat section. Um, a brief mention here, we'd like to thank the litany of folks who are helping sponsor our event tonight. Of course, Matthew from Event Santa Cruz, the Coastal Watershed Council, the Capitola Soquel Chamber of Commerce, Choose Santa Cruz, Community Bridges, the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz County, the Pajaro Valley Chamber of Commerce, Santa Cruz Waves, the Second Harvest Food Bank, and Think Local First. Uh, in addition, uh, we want to point you all to our ongoing COVID 2021 initiative uh, here at Lookout, which is the which is really the precursor to this forum this evening. Uh, obviously, we're doing COVID text alerts through our deputy managing editor, Mark Conley. If you do want to sign up for the latest COVID news throughout the day brought directly to your mobile device, you can text COVID to 831-508-7524. A little bit about our event format tonight. We're going to uh, interview each panelist individually for about eight to 10 minutes, uh, including questions to them that are sort of a compilation of what readers have sent us. Uh, after that, we are going to have a panel discussion in which we will work in questions from, again, that are both compilations of things readers have sent us and questions from individual readers. And then we might even have a little lightning round at the end uh, with Dr. Newell with some, a lot of the questions folks are asking about vaccines and vaccine tiers. Um, our panelists this evening are Dr. Gail Newell, uh, the county health officer. I always wanna throw county's chief health officer in there, but all the reporters tell me not to do that. Uh, Dr. Marv Kilpatrick, uh, an infectious disease expert from uh, UCSC, UC Santa Cruz. And uh, last but not least, Erica Padilla Chavez, uh, CEO of the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student uh, assistance and co-chair of uh, Pajaro Valley Saves Lives, Save Lives Committee. Uh, with that, we're going to kick it off here, and I think uh, Mallory's going to ask Dr. Newell some questions. Um, all right, so I'm going to kick things off with Dr. Gail Newell, our esteemed county health officer, um, who I am in frequent communication with, and I'm always very grateful for her time. Um, <laughs> so I want to start our 
start out with how would you sort of characterize the state of the COVID-19 pandemic in Santa Cruz County right now? Um, and sort of how does that compare to other counties and the rest of the state? Well, I wish that I could say that with the flip of the calendar into 2021, that things magically got better or that with a new president, everything is going to get better. Um, I think some things will be better, uh, both with the okay. new year and the new president, but um, these are very dark days for California in particular. Um, we were doing so well compared to the nation for so long and now we really are in the worst um, situation we've been in to date with um, many parts of our state uh, with no ICU beds. So the intensive care unit beds in the hospitals, um, no availability. And that's true all through Southern California, through the Central Valley, and then very small numbers of ICU beds in Sacramento and the Bay Area. And that's frightening, not just for those people who get COVID and might need care, but also mm -hmm. for everyone who might need an ICU bed and a reminder that that could be any of us. It could be after a car accident right. or um, some kind of unexpected sudden event. Um, so we really need to make sure that we have hospital capacity and ICU capacity and that our healthcare system has capacity care to care for all of us. Our healthcare workers are so exhausted after doing this for nearly a year. Yeah, yeah. And what about Santa Cruz in particular? Because I know for a lot of the time early in the pandemic, Santa Cruz was doing so well compared to most most counties, you know, in the state. And I think uh, is that still the case, or are we? Yeah, where are we kind of relative to the rest of California, even though we're all going through this hard time together? Yeah, um, Santa Cruz is still doing better than the state overall. And I want to make sure that the community knows that they deserve all of the credit for doing that because it's our individual behaviors that really determine how we do as a community. And so the community's willingness to put on a face covering when they leave the house, to stay home if they're feeling ill, to maintain their social distancing, um, to be compliant with what we've asked them to do. And I know it's a lot, um, but they get all the credit. Um, so for a long time, we had a very flat curve and very few deaths in our community. And then it caught mm -hmm. up to us in the fall and we started getting outbreaks in our um, skilled nursing facilities and our other residential care facilities. And then the rest of the state started really increasing in disease and we're not an, we're not an island and we have visitors right. and we travel ourselves and uh, are used to travel anyway. And uh, <laughs> so now our case rate is higher than it's ever been. So if you'll remember mm -hmm. back, you know, Halloween, we were in the orange tier that was very exciting. Then we got a little bit worse again. Mm -hmm. We were in the red for a couple of weeks. And then we went to the dreaded purple tier. Well, the trigger for the purple tier was seven cases per day per 100,000 people. And we're now wow. at 71. So we're at right. 10 times the number of cases we had when we were shocked to enter the purple phase in uh, the end of November. So um, okay. very disappointing. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, that's a good reason to follow the stay at home order, the regional stay at home guidelines that say no gatherings, private gatherings outside of your own household. You should stay home except to do essential activities, um, getting your groceries and others. So, okay. um, yep. Mm. I wish Not I had better news me. after all we've <laughs> yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, looking ahead, as we are all, we're hoping that things would change quickly with the new year. Um, but sort of what are your predictions based on trends you're seeing or information you're getting for the next few months? Do you have any idea when we might get out of the stay at home order, maybe climb back into that purple tier, red tier someday? Word is that the state's data looks good enough that we might be coming out of the regional stay-at-home order in the next couple of weeks. 
So, um, and they're basing that on the uh, four week projected ICU capacity. And um, I heard rumors today that uh, the Bay Area ICU capacity uh, is approaching that 15% in two weeks, four weeks okay. rather. Um, and we okay, uh, right. may be coming out of regionals. And when we come out of regional though, we're going right back into purple and we are a deep purple. So I don't want to get, okay. I don't want people to get too excited about any changes upcoming. Okay. Okay. Well, that's too bad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then um, we're moving on to what we are hoping will get us out of this permanently. Um, are you feel, how are you feeling about the vaccine, vaccine distribution and rollout locally um, and, and the pace of it? Uh, and what are sort of the biggest challenges to getting it where you want it to be? Well, just as I thought things were going to get a little easier for me in my position, I feel like the last mm -hmm. um, two weeks, three weeks, um, 2021 has been very, very difficult for me and for my mm -hmm. team in public health. Mm -hmm. We really want to ensure an equitable rollout of vaccine across the county and especially reaching our hard to reach populations and our most impacted populations in South County and um, sure. other affected areas like Live Oak and Beach Flats. Um, but instead, the state has sent uh, massive amounts of vaccine to the multi county entities. So that's um, Sutter, Kaiser, and Dignity in our area, Dignity Dominican. And they've been fantastic mm. partners, but they do mm. mostly work with the commercial lives, um, the, those who are mm. insured, and mostly predominantly North County folks. And um, mm. they have had the, um, get, given the go ahead to use the vaccine with more leeway than we have as the county. Um, so while okay. we're still working on trying to vaccinate the healthcare workers and get through phase 1A, the um, multi-county entities have moved into vaccinating the 75 plus and in some cases even 65 plus. So mm. that creates the, the reality, it's not just the optics, but the reality of inequities and we're working hard to address that and um, with mm. our valued partners in South County and um, we will be opening up a mass vaccination clinic at the fairgrounds next week uh, for healthcare workers to finish Exciting. up phase 1A. And then once we finish okay. that up, um, hopefully by the end of next week, we can move into our 75 plus. Okay, okay. Well, that's, that's some good news there. Yeah. Although it's but disappointing to hear about the issues and equity in the rollout. I'm sure we'll get to talk more about those and lots more about in general. Um, Thank I you. I'm going to turn say, it over to Chris now. Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah, I do you. want to say <laughs> that I hold that optimism for 2021. And I believe okay. that this year is going to get better and better. And that by the second half of the year, we're going to um, be able to start doing some small gatherings again, um, being with our friends and family, hugging each other. Um, uh, there'll still be restrictions on large gatherings. Um, and mm -hmm. other risky kinds of activities, but um, we're going to start mm -hmm. to do some of those things that we're really missing. Okay, so some better hope for the summer, hopefully, late summer maybe. All right, okay. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Newell. Hand it over to Chris and Marm. All right, Marm. So you've made it, uh, I think, one of your life goals here uh, via on Twitter or in other settings to sort of set the record straight about a lot of the misinformation out there about COVID-19. Is there one thing that you think people are sort of still misinformed about? Mm, I guess that's a tough question. I don't think I have one good answer for that. I think there's still some misunderstandings about exactly what activities are of highest risk and which activities are, are of such low risk that, that we should really divert our attention to other places. Um, and so I think the main things that are worth keeping in mind is that this is a respiratory pathogen that spread primarily by close contact and sustained close contact, um, and, and especially in indoor settings. And so if we can really focus our attention on basically the kind of core things that we've been obviously hearing about for the last, I guess it's been a full year now, but the basic things of distance, masks, and then um, 
setting, you know, basically whether you're in an enclosed space with someone or not, and then the kind of standard core public health stuff like hand hygiene, those are the ways that we can really greatly reduce um, our risk of, of becoming infected and passing the virus on to someone else. And so I think if, if we can recognize those highest risk activities and focus on those rather than worrying about the very small probability events, which I think sometimes still capture people's attention, um, that makes it best for us. So there's still quite a bit of uh, talk and excitement about, you know, if you're passing someone outside on a path briefly going in opposite directions, is the risk of that exactly zero? No, it's not exactly zero, but it's so much smaller than all the other things in our lives and spending time indoors together with people we don't live with that I think that distracts us from the key risks. So I think that's probably the most important thing. And then the second most important thing is just recognizing again, which we have known now for months. But, Sorry, Mark, but again, would you mind slowing down a little? Thank sure. you. But again, realizing that we can spread the virus both when we are sick, but also when we feel totally fine. So one of the most unfortunate and challenging things about this virus is that uh, we are infectious before we have symptoms. And so there are a few days basically where we get infected with the virus and we can pass it on to other people and feel totally fine. And the fact that that can happen and actually does happen makes it very, very difficult for us to uh, prevent spreading this virus to other people. So I think those are the core things that I think they're not so much misunderstood, but maybe sometimes we lose focus on those core, uh, core uh, mechanisms. Is that difference in the way COVID-19 is spread different than say a common cold or the flu? Um, so great question. So the spread of the viruses uh, that cause either the flu, COVID-19 or um, the common cold are similar in that they're all respiratory pathogens, but they seem to have some slight differences in how well they survive outside of the host. Um, so for example, how well they survive on surfaces or things like that, and to what extent they're also um, uh, spread at shorter or longer distances. And so we have um, quite a bit of information now that indicates that uh, the coronavirus, um, the number of people that each person infects is quite a bit higher for this virus than it is for both the flu and for the common cold. And the result of that is that um, this virus can basically spread very quickly in our communities. So from one person, each person can infect on average between two and four other people, often on average about two and a half or three. And in contrast, the flu and the common cold, on average people infect about one and a half other people. And so that simply the differences between the number of new people that each case gives rise to, those differences make a huge difference when you have this exponential growth process occurring. So I think that's the fundamental difference is that um, the kind of slight differences in infectiousness and probably also differences in how long you're infectious for, the combination of those two things. And as I said before, the fact that you can spread um, coronavirus for a couple of days before you have any symptoms, the combination of those three things really differentiate the probability of passing on the virus. And then of course, as we know, the coronavirus is almost between about five and 10 times more deadly than the flu and yet even more deadly than the common cold. So the, the combination of being more transmissible and much more um, deadly make it a much, much higher risk than the flu and the common cold viruses. I wanna ask you about uh, variants because we're hearing a lot about them. I think right before we got into this presentation, I saw a news alert uh, coming over my phone about a new one. Um, what can you tell us about, I, I think there's been a variant that's been found pretty readily in Santa Clara County nearby, and there's been other ones too. What do we know about these and, and how concerned should we be about them? Sure, so those are good questions. The challenges with the variants are that uh, this virus is, uh, like many other viruses, it is always mutating. So, so this virus is always exploring kind of different um, uh, features and trying to do it the best it can at infecting new people. Um, and so uh, we've anticipated that it would evolve, which is what's definitely happening. But one of the challenges has been because it's uh, the, a kind of virus, a single-stranded RNA virus, it's making mistakes all the time. And many of these mistakes or mutations in the virus have almost no effect or even have um, bad effects on the virus and make it worse at infecting other people. Um, in contrast, a small subset of mutations actually can benefit the virus and make it better at infecting um, other people. And so one of the challenges that scientists have had is we have seen the virus um, evolve over the past entire year, and there's been many, many, many different mutations, but it's been challenging sometimes to know whether the mutations have an actual impact on, on the actual functional traits of the virus itself or are just um, small changes that don't make much difference. 
So for example, you can imagine a human being, if we change, let's say our hair color a slight amount, that might not really change how many children we can have or how long we can survive. Whereas if we become you know, stronger or less strong or something like that, it could make a real difference. So these are some of the challenges we have in, in assessing that. So to directly answer your question, there's a, a, been a few new variants that have been detected recently and there's been some news reports and papers out. Um, there are some that people will have heard of, one that people have been calling the UK variant or a, basically a, a version of the virus that was detected first in the United Kingdom. Um, there's also a variant that was first detected in South Africa, another one that was also detected first in Brazil, and then there are actually a couple that have been first detected, as you've said uh, yourself, um, in California and also in Ohio and a few parts of the US. And so we have different amounts of information about the different kinds of variants, um, and some of them we have relatively high confidence that some of these mutations actually make a real difference, and other ones we're still trying to understand exactly whether these new variants have different actual properties of the virus from the old um, virus. And so I'll okay. briefly just make two quick comments. One is, is that Slowly. we have very <laughs> data that the variant from the UK um, appears to be much more transmissible than the kind of original strain that was spreading, about 50% more transmissible, with that exact number being, um, uh, we're still trying to estimate that more precisely. Um, and then there are a couple of variants that appear to have um, some mutations that affect um, how well our immune system recognizes them. However, let me say very clearly, there's a bunch of good data on this now, and it suggests that, well, some of these variants are not as well recognized by our immune system. The data we have so far suggests that both initial infection, and so immunity from infection, as well as our immune system's reaction to the vaccine, will still have at least a, a partial or substantial impact on infection with the virus. And so most people believe that, um, most of the scientists, I should say, the data that we have, that we interpret, um, suggests that vaccination and previous infection will still prevent either severe illness or, or illness completely um, from infection with these new variants from what we've seen so far. The big caveat, of course, is that the virus is still always evolving and we're always still trying to track this. So we do anticipate, the scientists that have been working on these kinds of things, including myself, anticipate that the virus will evolve at some point that will require us to update our vaccines and make them um, a closer match to the new kinds of viruses. And so these are the kinds of decisions and um, studies that are happening all the time right now. And all the vaccine manufacturers are trying to determine when they will need to update their virus, their, excuse me, their vaccines to best match the viruses that are circulating to provide us with the most effective immune response when we get vaccinated. We have last question and then we'll move on to Erica. And just a reminder for everybody, including myself, to speak a little slowly, given that we've got our our Spanish language folks, I see, see Andrea nodding there. Um, what about, we, we've heard a lot about vaccine safety, Marm, um, and then obviously we just had a batch of, of Moderna uh, vaccine uh, released here today that was sort of being held up because of concerns about allergic reactions. Uh, have you seen anything that gives you any pause whatsoever about uh, COVID-19 vaccine safety? Sure, so I, let me give the uh, listeners just a quick review of, of what we know and how we've done the studies so far, just to give us a little bit of confidence and then we can say what we're learning every day now. So the initial um, clinical trials that were just finished for the two vaccines that people will receive initially in the US, the Pfizer vaccine as well as the Moderna vaccine, those, both of those trials included tens of thousands of people. And so uh, they included between 15,000 for one vaccine and about 20,000 for the other. And we carefully followed both the people that got the vaccine as well as people that got the placebo but didn't know which they got and monitored their um, symptoms and all kinds of, you know, basically their, their condition afterwards. And so the, um, the reactions that people have had to, the, um, to being vaccinated with either one of these two vaccines included a number of, of reactions. So it wasn't that there was no effect at all, but the side effects that were observed were the ones that we normally anticipate with these kinds of vaccines. So um, the most common things people felt was basically pain at the injection site. That was a quite common um, side effect of being vaccinated that we saw more often in the vaccinated group than the placebo group. And we used that comparison to interpret whether the vaccine likely caused that versus it was just uh, an accidental possibility. So that's one uh, side effect that people saw quite frequently. Uh, some other ones are things like a headache or a little bit of fatigue. So there are a number of these milder symptoms um, that uh, that were observed and that were likely caused by the vaccine because they were observed at much higher frequencies in people that were vaccinated than received the placebo um, in these initial trials. So, uh, so we have a huge amount of data, tens of thousands of people that show us what kinds of things we can expect to see 
And all of the things that were seen in the, in the clinical trials were very mild and much, 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 much less severe than the disease itself. So that's why the FDA and the CDC were very, very strongly supportive of suggesting that, that getting this vaccine is a very, very positive thing to do in terms of a kind of risk of vaccination versus risk of infection. And that's the way they actually made the decision in terms of granting this emergency use authorization for this vaccine. So, so that's the background that we have so far. And then I will just say, of course, those clinical trials, while they were great and had tens of thousands of people, we are now vaccinating millions of people. So we are now scaling up this vaccination to a much, much higher level. And it is possible that the vaccines do cause additional side effects, but at much rarer frequencies. And we are doing our best now to determine if that's the case. So then let me now directly address your question, which is that in the initial rollout in the first few tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of vaccinations that occurred in the US, there were some allergic reactions that occurred. And so the first question that the that scientists tried to answer is, were those reactions caused by the vaccine or were they possibly caused by something else and just coincided with the vaccine? And let me try to um, tell the reader something that I think isn't so intuitive until you think about it carefully. And that is that if you give say a million people or even more, say 10 million people, a shot on a given day. And even if there's nothing in that shot, but salt water, so some sort of saline solution that has nothing in it at all, and follow those people for two weeks. If you follow two, 10 million people for two weeks, many, many, many things will happen to those people, right? So there'll be car accidents, there'll be heart attacks, there'll be all kinds of things that will occur that of course have nothing to do with the vaccine. And so one of the big challenges that we have in a very large vaccine rollout like this is assessing when we do see a reaction after a vaccination, is it caused by the vaccine or just is it caused by something else happening to that person? So in direct response to your question, um, there were a number of reactions that occurred following vaccination um, with the Moderna vaccine in California, and they're investigating to try to ask, are these bad effects caused by the vaccine? And if so, why? Or were they simply um, caused by something else? And so that's been the, the kind of ongoing challenge. So um, there is a recognition that in both the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, there's an ingredient that some people, it looks like about on average, one in a hundred thousand or even a little bit less of people will have an allergic reaction to a certain um, ingredient in these. And so people that have had a past experience with that um, are, are basically uh, advised to kind of uh, be more careful with that. So, um, so, so those things do exist. And I wanna acknowledge that side effects of vaccination do occur and they, many, vac many uh, side effects will occur that are mild and, and therefore much worth their, it's very much worth the risk of those versus getting infected. And then the more severe ones that can happen, um, the clinical trials suggest that those are very rare or absent, but then as we roll it out to more and more people, it's possible to have some rare side effects. And the main challenge that um, we're facing right now is just to assess how often do those occur and what we can do to try to minimize those. Okay, all right, Mel, take it away. All with right, her. well, that was packed full of information. I'm gonna like sit down and listen to that again a bunch of times. That was uh, great. Um, thank you so much, Marm. Um, all right. So uh, we're going to turn now to our third panelist, uh, Erica Padilla Chavez. Um, and so you are the CEO of the Pajaro Valley uh, Prevention and Student Association, and that's been your job before the pandemic, <laughs> right? And so then uh, since the pandemic, you're also the co-chair of uh, this group, Pajaro Valley Saves Lives. Um, and I'm wondering if you could start by just telling us a little bit about what Pajaro Valley Saves Lives, what this group is, and why was it formed? Like, what need did you see in the community? Great. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Muy buenas tardes. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in the Pajaro Valley, which, um, you know, South County, Pajaro Valley, Watsonville, we use those terms interchangeably in South County. Mm -hmm. um, in the Pajaro Valley, we have a history of working very collaboratively among various um, nonprofit organizations, public health agencies, city, schools. Um, and when the pandemic hit, it became very clear that we needed to organize ourselves to address the emerging needs that um, would evolve as a result of the pandemic. Uh, because we we have an extensive history of working with uh, the diverse and primarily Latino and high monolingual and now a growing indigenous population in Watsonville. We just knew intuitively that we needed to organize ourselves uh, and prepare for dissemination of information in a culturally and linguistic appropriate way. Um, mm -hmm. So 
out of that initial gut feeling that, oh, we need to come together and start working together. And through partnerships with public health, with Dr. Newell, her team, and other members of the health department, we were able to identify specific messages that uh, collectively we could design to communicate to our community what mm. was happening, what the advice was, what the public health uh, safeguards that they could engage in um, would be. Mm. Uh, so we did that really out of a pureness of wanting to disseminate appropriate and timely public health information to the community in South County. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, and so I know that that you talked about in, in our earlier discussions that, you know, part of what you were trying to, to deal with and part of what you've seen as the pandemic has unfolded is that um, some of the pre existing inequities within the county uh, were very much exposed during the pandemic and and made worse, um, you know, through the pandemic by the virus itself and by the economic consequences. Um, and I wonder if you could just sort of talk a little bit about that, if there are any sort of specific examples of that that you've seen. I know you're dealing with people, so many different people and families on a daily basis. Um, yes, but yeah, yes. Anything you want to share? Yeah, so just for the viewers, um, a little bit of context about South County, and I'm going to reference a, a wonderful report that I reference often uh, that was produced by, by Dr. Newell's team, the health assessment. Uh, that was done for the county of Santa Cruz back in 2017. It, it has great rich data about the in health indicators of our, of our county. And um, when you look at that report, you, you, you see things like the fact that Latinos, uh, Latino households have the highest percentage of uh, households that don't have basic self-sufficiency income standards met. What does that mean? Mm. Is that if and in Watsonville, what do we know about Watsonville? Over 80% of the population is Latino. What do we know about, mm -hmm. you know, the majority of, of individuals that have been, um, you know, uh, uh, impacted with COVID or have died are in fact Latino. So we know that the indicators such as income disparity uh, play a huge role. So let's kind of flesh that out a bit. So what does that mean to a household that doesn't have basic self-sufficiency income standards met. It often means that a family is having to have two to three jobs just to make ends meet. And it often means that these jobs are in essential environments, right? What we call essential workers. So the rate of exposure for these individuals who are just trying to put food on the table and pay the rent is much greater than those of us who have the opportunity to work in an office, to work in secluded areas, right? And mm -hmm. when you think about what that income disparity, how it's connected to the um, adverse health outcomes that we've seen with COVID, you can't help but to see the connection, right? Mm -hmm. This is what public health mm -hmm. call the impacts of the social determinants of health. And we see it very vividly play out in mm -hmm. the um, it's why our group of, of agricultural leaders and public health um, leaders in the nonprofit and in the government sector are working so closely to try to figure out how we can help mitigate immediately the impacts that we are mm -hmm. seeing in our community. And then in the long term, begin to have discussions about how we need to work differently to minimize future right. impacts to this degree, because we need to prepare right. ourselves another crisis or another pandemic, God forbid, anytime soon. But we, we are learning okay. much about the, the inequity and what it does to people. We have a responsibility to, to study it along the way and to work differently. Right, right. Well, sort of in that sort of future looking vein, um, wondering, you know, as Dr. Newell said, we're still very much in the dark days of the pandemic, but looking forward a little bit, I mean, in terms of what could be done now, but also um, in the future as things get better, um, what are some of the like long-term impacts that you're concerned about um, of, of all the different effects of, of the virus and the pandemic on, on the wow. Pajaro Valley? Okay. The, you know, we've had this conversation with our colleagues and there's so many impacts that we're seeing now that we fear are going to be long lasting. But because I am in the business of, of behavioral health and mental health, I can tell you firsthand that already we are seeing the impact that the trauma 
uh, that this pandemic has caused on many families, uh, stemming from economic hardships to actual lives lost of loved ones, um, mm -hmm. is going to be a, a, a long lasting impact, I think, not just in Santa Cruz or in Watsonville, but I frankly think across the globe. So the mental mm -hmm. needs of our community, I think, will be a continuous uh, area of focus for us. And, and so I'm glad Dr. Newell is, is here because we can't underestimate the public health emergency that uh, someone called it the epidemic of the pandemic, right? The mental health needs right. uh, of, of, of our community. And I really much uh, do believe in that. And then economically, um, what I can tell you we have seen in the Pajaro Valley is that through our partnership with partners like the Community Foundation of Santa Cruz and other philanthropic agencies, we've been able to pull some resources to be able to support people keeping their home and preventing homelessness. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. even though we've done a very good job in trying to coordinate those efforts, we know of families that have in fact become homeless. Mm -hmm for a fact. We know that we weren't able to keep every individual housed. And even though we have an eviction moratorium, and even though we know that, you know, uh, there are uh, legal ways in which to argue keeping housed, the truth is when you're in a community with a high percentage of indigent community members or undocumented community members, mm -hmm. these individuals oftentimes don't know how to navigate those policies or, or navigate the legal world to advocate right. for themselves. And so we've seen a high percentage of families um, lose their housing as a result. And so that's going to have lasting impacts, not just for the adults who became unhoused, but the children mm -hmm. who are now living in adverse housing conditions or even more extensive overcrowded, overcrowding conditions. So we've got a long road ahead of us for true, um, what I call achievement of community health and wellness. But here's the beauty of, of where the opportunity lies. I am a mm -hmm. believer of data. I am a big believer that using the data that we know the county collects, that many of our governmental partners collect, should be driving the allocation of resources. So you ask the question, how do we move forward? How do we prevent this? Mm -hmm. Well, we're gonna have to be disciplined. And we're, if we're curious about ensuring that those who, who are less fortunate have an equitable opportunity to live a life uh, uh, um, full of dignity and justice like you and I have uh, an opportunity to do, then we're gonna have to use data to park our resources into the communities and neighborhoods that are demonstrating the maximum amount of need. Uh, but mm -hmm. I do think there's commitment in Santa Cruz County to do that. Uh, we've already begun to engage in conversations around this framework and we're looking forward to working with county and state and other officials to make that be the case for communities of color and under underrepresented and often forgotten communities across the, the country. Right, right. Well, that actually brings us to, I mean, there's there's so many things to talk about from, from that and thank you so much. Um, but the sort of first uh, reader and lookout question that we had that we wanted to throw to the general panel was um, kind of jumping off of what Erica was talking about. Uh, what are some of the specific mental health impacts from COVID-19, from, from the pandemic itself, not the disease, um, that we're seeing in the community and how best can they be addressed? Um, I don't know if, if uh, Dr. Newell, you wanna jump in and then Erica, if you wanna come back with some more of the, of the specifics of what you're seeing, because I know it's been a lot. And Dr. Newell, I know there's a lot of other things. So nationally, we know that during this pandemic, we have seen increases in domestic violence, in homicide, in suicide, in uh, mental illness of all different kinds, in overdoses from alcohol, opioids, um, methamphetamines. Um, and so uh, Santa Cruz was largely spared from those for the first six months or so of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. I think that indicates the resilience that this community has, but uh, it wore thin at some point as mm -hmm. probably we all can imagine from our own personal experiences. And um, unfortunately I ha um, have to report that uh, we are joining the nation and seeing upticks in all of those areas as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, but the population I'm most worried about is our children. 
um, who have been a, more than a year now, I think, right? Uh, no, not quite a year yet, um, but out of the classroom. And so many of our community's children rely on the school setting for um, more than education. They rely on the school setting for all different kinds of social support, um, mm -hmm. feeding programs, which have continued to some extent, but feeding programs, mm -hmm. social support, um, especially our LGBTQ kids really struggling during this time. Um, other mm -hmm. kids struggling with substance use, uh, mental illness, um, other issues mm -hmm. where they may not have the necessary support at home. Um, to be separated from their schools is very traumatic. And I think for our children, we just don't know the impact on child development right. of um, the lack of human touch and in-person friendship relationships. So only time will tell, but um, that's the population I'm most worried about. Really in many ways, the most vulnerable population in our community. Yeah. There, is yeah. there anything specifically, Erica, that you've seen that really, uh, you know, has made you, you've seen a lot in your career working with the schools. Is there anything that really sort of puts this pandemic over the top in your own personal experience? Mm. Well, just in sheer volume of demand of services in our agency, our demand has grown by over 300 percent. Right. Oh. That's 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 just it. it there's no way I can supply them with that service. So we lean on our partners as much as we can to link them to care. But I will tell you that the percentage of students coming to us or the percentage of children and families, because we primarily work with, with uh, children, youth and their families, um, the increase in depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, sleep disorders is off the charts, um, which are all manifestations of what I would call the, the response, the physiological and mental response to what is happening in their environment right now due to the pandemic. Um, we've seen, uh, unfortunately, some, some, some suicides happen in, in our community, uh, both in North County and South County among the youth. Um, we are seeing suicide ideation um, rates up for the county as a whole. Um, so these are all indicators that causes one to worry about what this means um, long-term. Um, but here's also kind of the silver lining to all of this is that I know all of us have been working really hard to try to create what I call e-spaces for, for children to connect and, and to, to uh, exercise their, their agency as children. And, um, and, and when given that opportunity, we are seeing children and youth respond. Um, I'm very happy to see that uh, in the case of Pajaro Valley Unified, they, they have safe schools for those children that are definitely struggling with mm -hmm. uh, their inability to log on and connect uh, with their peers electronically, of course, but still. Uh, so I think the out of the box thinking that's been happening has been wonderful, but you know, I'm not sure that I can measure or give you the volume of the mental health impacts. I just, I know for a fact, because of the work that we do, that we're talking about little lives all having very uh, real impact. And we're, we're just there trying to provide support. And, you know, Gail, I think we have our work cut out for us in that arena um, long-term, but, uh, you know, I, I think uh, when we talk about mental health, all of us can play a very important role in ensuring that people are feeling heard that they're feeling um, valued, that they're feeling um, uh, important and needed in this world. And we all can play a role, a very important role in lending a, our ear uh, to people right now. In, in looking at the mm -hmm. q and I'm seeing a ton of questions about farm workers and farm worker vaccination. And I don't know, Dr. Newell or Erica or even Marm, if you have any insight as to where, where that sort of stands right now. Well, it's all on hold waiting for the new uh, state guidelines for vaccination priorities, uh, state and federal. Um, it was the federal government that about 10 days ago now announced that we would be moving into 65 plus um, and away from occupation and the state has reiterated that. Uh, however, there's been tremendous understandable pushback around that um, the age 
framework for vaccination makes sense in that really during this surge, what we're trying to do right now is maintain capacity in our hospitals and our ICUs and our healthcare system. And so to do that, we have to focus on the people most likely to die or be hospitalized and that's our elders. So that's, it makes sense. But at the same time, all of these folks who have no choice but to be out in the front line and be exposed, um, understandable that uh, they feel that they should be vaccinated. And of course we all do. Uh, we have been working closely with the Ag Commissioner with the county, the Farm Bureau representatives of the farm workers, and um, have been planning uh, mass vaccination clinics at the fairgrounds. Um, when it is time for food workers to be vaccinated, we uh, anticipate that they will be open, that uh, there will be no documentation required so all they will need to do is verbally give a name, an address, and a date of birth. Um, and that if they're coming from other counties after having their first dose elsewhere, for example, with our migrant farm workers that may be picking berries in Santa Maria one month and in Santa Cruz the next month, um, it will be enough for them to just show us their vaccination card, which everybody gets when they get a vaccine. And uh, it will tell us what kind of vaccine they had and what date, and we will honor that and give them dose number two. And we're working to arrange transportation and uh, different modes of um, communication. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, thanks Dr. Newell. Um, and then we're gonna move on to another, uh, this is a, not a, a vaccine question, but a question sort of about the virus. Um, so maybe start with Dr. Newell and then Marm, if you wanna drop it. Uh, jump in. Um, has Santa Cruz County done any testing or looking for some of these variants uh, that we're interested in, the UK variant or the, the new California one? Um, and, you know, is there any plan for UCSC to step in and help with that? What capacity do we have locally? Um, I don't know if, if Dr. Noel, you want to start. Uh, the only things that are happening locally are um, there's a statewide wastewater um, study going on uh, done by the state of California to look for variants in our sewer, uh, you know, our wastewater. So um, coming out of our bodies and going into the sewer systems. Um, and other than that, uh, the only thing locally is happening at UC Santa Cruz. So uh, they're doing some exciting work there and I'll turn it over to Marm and hope that he has more information. <laughs> Sure. So there's a, just a kind of a new project in partnership just starting up in the last couple of weeks to try to do exactly that to really track uh, what kinds of viruses we have in our community um, and how that's changing going forward. So that'll be a partnership between um, the UC University of California Santa Cruz and um, all the partners in, in the county as well. Okay, great. Um, some Chris, questions. do you have the next question? Yeah, I mean, just some questions about the numbers here, Dr. Newell, and, and you've already referenced that, you know, the MCEs, um, but a, a question. So we've reported that there are about, you know, a little over 16,000 vaccine doses in the county. And as of our last check, less than half have been injected, but I know you've been announcing uh, efforts to, uh, to sort of step that up. Obviously, the Moderna pause, right, that we reported about today, those vaccines have now been released. So I guess trying to just figure out, and we might have to do this in buckets, right, because we've got four different buckets that folks are getting vaccine out of. But let's start with the county. How much new vaccine does the county expect uh, coming in the next couple of weeks? And how quickly can it be distributed? And who does it go to? We can... I'm gonna answer uh, one question right off the bat. We can put vaccine in arms as fast as we can get it. We are required to hold back 50% of second doses. So everyone who gets a first dose has to have a second dose either three or four weeks later. And so we don't wanna be in a situation where we don't have enough to give for the second dose um, because it's not as effective then. And so um, other than that, um, we can get it out to our healthcare partners or our own mass vaccination clinics as quickly as we get it in. So um, 
we now have a vaccination data dashboard on our website. It just went up today in a rudimentary form at santacruzhealth.org. You go there, you go to the COVID page and there's a big vaccine button, alcohol button, and um, it will take you to a vaccine website with a diagram that shows all of the phases and tiers so people can say approximately when it's gonna be their turn. It shows an arrow of where we are now. It shows arrows about when we're gonna to get to future phases, hopefully. But in terms of the numbers, it's got the numbers received to date, and this is only by the county. So we don't get any information about the federal pharmacy partnership that does our residential care facilities or about the multi-county entities. So um, the information that's there is um, 17,900 vaccines received to date. 7,525 of those have gone into arms and the remaining 10,375 are either on hold for second doses or already allocated to our healthcare partners or our own mass vaccination clinics um, in the coming few days. So we plan it so that we only have enough for the coming few days. We wanna get them in arms as quickly as we get them. And so um, we've got, uh, we share those vaccinations with all of our healthcare partners. So um, the hospitals, for instance, relied on our county vaccinations for their uh, medical staff and employees because they hadn't received their allocations yet. Um, all three of the hospitals got their vaccines that way from us. Um, in addition, we give them to the federally qualified health centers for their own staff and employees and for their phase 1A healthcare workers. And um, also um, our dialysis centers, all the phase 1A folks. So our dialysis centers are uh, first responders that do healthcare, paramedics, EMTs, um, and then the mass vaccination clinics that are happening at Dominican at Sutter and next week starting at the fairgrounds, um, uh, we have all of that allocated to those efforts. Okay. We expect to get about 2000 vaccines more per week, not very many. Hmm. Okay. Do you have any sense of how many are actually going to the health systems and how the health systems are distributing them from within the county, which sort of gets to the point that you were making earlier about South County potentially being neglected here? A lot of questions in the chat about South County being neglected with the vaccine. Yeah, it's not just how they're distributing or administering the vaccine here, but it's, are we getting our fair share in Santa Cruz? So for example, one of our multi-county entities is Kaiser. And so Kaiser, Northern California gets an allotment from the state and then their central decision-making uh, entity, we call it, I call it the mothership, the Kaiser mothership determines how much should go to each of its locations. And my suspicion is, is because we don't have a Kaiser hospital and we don't have very many Kaiser patients in Santa Cruz yet, um, that they're not sending very many vaccines our way. Um, likewise, um, the Dignity system um, that Dominican Hospital and the Dignity Foundation outpatient um, have, Dominican has received abundant vaccine and has been very generous in sharing that with the community. But at the mothership level, um, Dignity Outpatient um, just got their first allocation this week and it was very small. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't have any insight into those numbers at all. Right. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna give uh, Dr. Newell a break here, although you might wanna <laughs> jump in. You just know the answers. Um, but uh, maybe Marm, we can go to you with some questions about the vaccine. Um, a lot of people have questions about after they get the vaccine, um, can you spread it to other people? Uh, do you still need to wear a mask? Uh, what do we know about that? And is that different than someone who had COVID, right? And has the sort of natural immunity from that? Sure, sure. so um, let's see. 
I want to try to answer this as carefully as possible. So the the goal of the clinical trials that were done right. were actually their their aim, their primary aim was to ask, did this vaccine stop people from getting sick? So that was actually right. their primary goal in the clinical trials. And some of the trials had a secondary aim of trying to ask, answer the questions you just asked me, which is, does it prevent infection? And does it prevent you transmitting the virus to someone else? Um, and for all the trials that have been done and even the ones that are planned, those are all secondary aims. And what it means is that when, the, uh, when those trials are finished, those are secondary that we're not, they're not uh, making, analyzing those data as rapidly. So, so, that's okay, the, so they have the data already, but they're analyzing it now to find out. So I'll, I'll now directly answer your question. But I just okay. wanted to say why I'm going to give the answer that I'm going okay. to give. So the answer then is that um, we have some data from, from one of the two vaccines. So let, let me take one step back and say both vaccines we know um, are about 95% effective at preventing symptomatic infection. That is to say that if you when we ran these trials with tens of thousands of people and we counted the number of symptomatic cases, people that got some COVID symptoms, got a test and the mm -hmm. test was positive, we said, you had COVID, that the, the um, efficacy was about 95%. So that's fantastic. So that's the 95% reduction in symptomatic infections. In addition, right. for one of the two vaccines, the Moderna vaccine, uh, they have a little bit of data, not directly aimed to answer this question, but was used for it, which was basically, um, when people came in for their second dose, they also took a swab from them and determined whether there were people that were not sick, but infected anyway. So we call these asymptomatic infections. So basically kind of okay. hidden infections. And so mm -hmm. what we, the data we have so far suggests that if you get vaccinated, um, the, the chance you will get a symptomatic illness is reduced by 95%, so that's great. And mm -hmm. in addition to that, there was also about a two thirds reduction in asymptomatic infections. So even the chance you would have a kind of silent infection. So the combination okay. of those two things is great. And it means that we actually have pretty good evidence for one of the vaccines, the Moderna one, that it, that it has a great effect at reducing asymp excuse me, symptomatic infections and not complete, but a pretty good effect at asymptomatic infections. We unfortunately don't okay. have the same data for the Pfizer vaccine, but the vaccines, they're mm -hmm. so similar in how they work, the kind of actual like underpinnings of the mechanisms that I think most scientists would say they would expect the results to be very similar for the Pfizer vaccine. How, so okay. what that means is, is that both vaccines are going to help us a lot in reducing both illness. I should also say one more thing. In addition to those 95% uh, reductions in kind of any sort of symptomatic infections, um, the, especially the Moderna vaccine, which had the, the most amount of data, did a great job at preventing severe illness. So in fact, in the Moderna trial, there were 30 severe cases and they were all in the placebo group. So there were actually no severe illnesses in the vaccinated group in the Moderna um, vaccine trial. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. However, so what that means is that the vaccines are gonna do a great job at reducing symptomatic illness in our communities and transmission. But because of what I just said, they're not 100% effective at blocking symptomatic infections and they're not 100% effective at blocking asymptomatic infections. That means a small fraction of people will still get symptomatic infections and also a fraction of people will get these kind of hidden or asymptomatic infections. That means that even if you are vaccinated, you can still, you still have a chance of getting infected and passing that on to the people around you. And so until all the people around you are also vaccinated, then that means that you're gonna still need to be careful to try to not get infected because you don't wanna be one of the 5% that still gets sick. And you also don't wanna be one of the people that gets infected, doesn't know it and passes it on to the people around you. So, um, so I think, and Dr. Newell can uh, back me up here or, or clarify this, but I think the strong recommendation is going to be that people that get vaccinated take the same measures that they would to prevent both getting infected and passing it on until we have widespread vaccination of most members of our community. And so, so that's a slightly disappointing to people that might want to get vaccinated and be able to have parties, right? But <laughs> the reason that we're not going to uh, recommend that and strongly recommend against that is because that's to both prevent you, the person that got vaccinated from being one of the unfortunate 5% and to protect the people around you that you might accidentally infect. And so people that got vaccinated, basically, it'll help you a bunch in, in greatly reducing your odds of severe illness, really mm -hmm. highly reducing your odds of symptomatic infection at all by 95%, but we, we can't 100% prevent you from getting infected or passing it on. And because of that, 
will want people that are vaccinated to still take precautions. So masks, distance, the kind of standard right. stuff that we're all recommending. And so, okay. and that we'll be able to relax those things as the fraction of our community that gets vaccinated fully rises to a level that's high enough for us to really be pretty confident that we're gonna be able to protect all the people around us. Okay. Do you wanna clarify okay. any of that? Like I wanted to make sure I got that clear. Not an agreement from Dr. Newell, is that full approval of that message? Okay, then we're gonna have, we have one more question kind of related on the immunity topic. Um, this actually came in through our, our Spanish channel and it's similar to a few other questions we've had. Um, if you'd have if you've had COVID and you received plasma, right? So I'm assuming this means plasma with with antibodies. Um, do you still need the vaccine, um, or is that enough immunity? Sure. So um, so let's see. So I will say that uh, the vaccine trials included some people that actually had previous exposure, and at least so far there's. There has not been any effort by um, the federal government, CDC, any of these people to try to differentiate people that have been previously exposed from those that have not in terms of priorities. And the reason for that is because we believe that even if you've been previously exposed, getting the vaccine will boost your immune system even further. And we do have some evidence that there is a small level, a small fraction of people that have been reinfected with the virus. And so because, because of two things, one, it's actually quite difficult to know exactly if you've been previously exposed or not, some of the antibody tests, actually, excuse me, all of the antibody tests are not perfect. And so we don't want mm -hmm. to uh, give someone an antibody test, say, oh, it looks like you've been previously exposed and be wrong and therefore not right. vaccinate that person. So instead of doing that until we can have a really, really effective test, we are choosing to basically vaccinate people regardless of previous infection status. And so the current okay. recommendations are for people that are in the categories that are um, uh, in the tier that are aimed for, uh, prioritized for vaccination they're being vaccinated regardless of whether they've been exposed in the past or not. Okay, Dr. Newell, is that um, if people have had COVID, if they've received antibody treatment, um, should they still you know, get vaccinated at the same time as they would without it? Absolutely, yes. If they have a current case of COVID, they need to wait 14 days before they get vaccinated. Okay. If they're sick at all, with any kind of viral syndrome or anything, they need to be uh, well for about 14 days before they should get their vaccine. Okay. okay. Pivoting, pivoting to a big one I'm seeing a lot. Uh, question, I don't have health care. Where can I get the vaccine? And Erica, mm -hmm. I think Dr. Newell and Yule can probably tag team this one, but that's a big question. Want to start, Erica? Well, I just wanna, um, I'm gonna clearly say that we have improvement to do in the equitable distribution of vaccines. Uh, I think Dr. Nguyen will acknowledge that. I can tell you that our Pajaro Valley Safe Life Groups very much believes that. We submitted a letter to the Board of Supervisors documenting a need to improve in the equitable distribution of vaccines. It is true what Dr. Nguyen has stated that it appears that the bigger healthcare agencies uh, who receive their allotment are um, triaging a system for their for their their registered patients or clients um, and it's it's working for them um, unfortunately in South County we just don't have that those level of of healthcare systems in place and we have a high percentage of individuals that uh, as I, I mentioned earlier are indigent undocumented individuals uh, and that's the number one question frankly that most of us in the nonprofit sector in South County who work with these families are getting. And uh, I have to be honest to say that I don't know. And that's the response that I am informing our families. I don't know, which is why we want to engage with the county to have greater clarity, uh, to, to work with them as they're mapping it out uh, so that we can communicate to the community as we have been this far and begin to calm some of the anxiety um, and some of, the, of their own uh, feeling of, of, of being felt dismissed in this process. So we need to address that. And uh, I understand we're gonna start the conversation uh, pretty soon around that. So I, I just wanna uh, echo that Dr. Noel, I agree. Um, I think uh, we can do a better job. Um, and that's, that's what I wanna say about that, uh, Dr. Noel. Thank you, Erica. You're absolutely correct um, that we've got a lot of work to do. Um, this pandemic has unveiled so many rifts in our society. 
um, and uh, we need to make sure that we address those um, not and not stop after the pandemic is addressed. We, we need have a lot of work to do going forward. Um, what I can say is that right now, healthcare workers who are uninsured or underinsured can go to any of the current facilities to be vaccinated. And there are many healthcare workers who don't have health insurance. So home health providers, um, uh, promotoras, community health workers, our CNAs working in our skilled nursing facilities and residential care and substance use disorder uh, congregate, congregate settings, they're all eligible now for vaccine and they will not be turned away at any location they go to for um, vaccination. And the county right now, we are only doing healthcare workers. So they can go to the flea market site at Sutter. They can go to Dominican uh, healthcare workers. Um, we've just opened up uh, at the Safeway pharmacies, but only for healthcare workers. You don't need insurance at any of those places. Um, once we get into the 75 plus, so probably by the end of next week, uh, we will be well underway with our county clinics at the um, fairgrounds and no one will be turned away. In addition, um, no one is ever turned away from our safety net clinics so they can get their vaccines at Salud Para La Gente, Santa Cruz Community Health, or any of the county health centers um, when it's their turn to get their vaccine. But I guess the question there is, is will there be enough supply? Eventually, um, there's not enough supply for anyone now, even if they do have insurance. So um, there's just not enough anywhere in the nation. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. So Matt. another, yeah, I guess we have another kind of vaccine safety question uh, too that are sort of related to fertility. Um, there are rumors or you know, ideas going around that the vaccine could cause infertility, um, and also questions about whether people should get it if they're pregnant. Um, so maybe Dr. Mill, do you wanna start with that? Um, I'll start with the pregnancy question because I am an obstetrician yeah. gynecologist. I, I delivered over 10,000 yeah. babies in my OB career, um, mm -hmm. and I keep up with the medical literature around obstetrics. And the American College of OBGYN strongly encourages pregnant women to get a vaccine. Uh, they do recommend speaking with their um, obstetrician uh, or midwife or whoever's doing their um, prenatal care prior to that, um, but they do recommend that they get vaccinated. Breastfeeding, okay. same, um, but if you'd like to talk with your pediatric provider, that would be uh, a good idea as well. Um, in terms of fertility, I've just started hearing these rumors. Um, there is no medical reason why this vaccine would create infertility or any other problems. It definitely doesn't cause uh, gender change. That's another um, thing that's going around. It doesn't cause DNA that, yeah. or RNA mutations. Yeah. And um, so there's, there's just no evidence that uh, just the way the vaccine works, that any of these things could even be possible, not even conceivable. Okay. okay. Uh, Marm, do you want to add anything to that? That's reassuring news, hopefully, for people. Nope, Marm might be on mute. Yeah, I can't hear you. I don't know if other people can. Sorry, <laughs> I muted myself just to be clear. So, no um, yeah, so let me just add the one thing is just that there are some data that suggests that pregnant women, when they get COVID, actually can have uh, even worse outcomes. And so that further supports what Dr. Newell just said, which is that right. uh, they should consult with their doctor, but there's actually good reasons for them to get vaccinated when they do get their turn to do so. So that's a, another uh, reason to go that direction. Great, great. Um, okay, thank you both. That's some um, good news. Um, so just to let everyone know, in about five-ish minutes, we're going to go to our lightning round with Dr. Newell about vaccine <laughs> access and a few more kind of finer grain vaccine questions. So some of that should um, should be coming up soon. Um, Chris, do you want to go ahead or I have another question? Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions, questions about tourism and masking um, and whether there should be stronger regulations put in place to tell tourists to wear masks 
Uh, Dr. Newell, I, I'm wondering if you can sort of walk us through uh, whether tours, you know, how you're viewing the amount of people, uh, especially with the warm weather over the weekend coming to Santa Cruz and, and their, their behavior. I thought it was going to rain all weekend in Santa Cruz. Uh, this past weekend <laughs> is what we're getting questions. Oh, particularly, <laughs> particularly on West Cliff Drive. Apparently it was pretty, it was pretty crowded out there. And a lot of people- Well, when the virus, when the virus um, first reared its head in this country almost a year ago now, we had no idea how this virus was spread. And I remember even uh, a report from a scientist that got a lot of media coverage out of San Diego saying that even ocean swimming was dangerous and you could get it from the water. And it turns out that's not the case at all. I know all. that scientist. <laughs> yes, and uh, he actually retracted that uh, article and that recommendation and was talking more about the sewage from Tijuana anyway than from this, um, this COVID virus. Um, but being, as Marm said earlier, um, it's nearly impossible, not completely zero, but it's nearly impossible to uh, spread this virus outdoors during activity. So um, surfing is safe, walking with your surfboard down to the ocean is safe, even passing mm -hmm. someone on the stairs um, back and, you know, up and down on the stairs to the beach is safe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, not completely 0% ever, but um, mm -hmm. very, very low risk. Masks are not required when you're outdoors. Um, uh, unless you're within six feet, standing still, having a conversation with someone. So we ask that everyone who's outdoors exercising or doing activities, not swimming though, but um, having a mask with them so they can put it on if they um, come into contact with someone, they wanna stop and chat, um, be ready for that. But otherwise it, it's not something that people should be fearful of. Let that one go. Great. Anything to add, Mark? <laughs> I'll just add to that that I think what we really should be concerned about is if we do find ourselves in an indoor space. So, for example, if we're going to go shopping or something like that and there's a line, and especially if there might be a line indoors to go into a store, I actually was downtown and, and that occurred, uh, happened to me a couple times. And so, those are the places where we do want to remember to have our masks on, to have the space if we can. And that's the time we really should be really careful about those. Um, uh, rules that we all kind of know about very well now, whereas as Dr. Newell said, I think we can try to focus our energy on the things that are really high risk and worry much, much less about mm -hmm. the low risk things. So I worry a little bit about people getting, uh, uh, focusing too much of their energy on say outdoor tourism on West Cliff and then going into a, mm -hmm. a shop or a store or something like that and ending up, you know, three feet from someone else without a mask on for several minutes, that's so many, mm -hmm. probably a hundred or a thousand fold more dangerous. So I think we, we wanna make sure okay. to focus our attention on those things that are the highest risk. That is, I think we didn't get to it, but maybe if, if one of you could sort of answer very quickly, um, we did get a few different questions about, you know, grocery shopping, that's a pretty essential thing that people do and they're inside. <laughs> um, sort of how risky is that? If you're 80, you're going to the store, is that you should really find a way to not have to go to the grocery store? Um, and then how does that compare? I think we can assume farmer's markets are much safer, but if you can maybe sort of talk a little bit about that too. I'll say something briefly and then um, Dr. Noel, if you wanna uh, say add something to it. So uh, thankfully, most of the stores that I have been to in Santa Cruz County um, have taken the recommendations quite strongly to basically make a, make it possible to have a safe shopping experience. So that just means mm -hmm. that uh, that if you're you know giving your, your groceries to the cashier to basically, you know, to to run, run them on the cashier, then you can give them a little bit of space. They can give you a little bit of space that enables you to be safe there. Obviously everyone has their masks on when they're indoors. As long as that's happening, that's good. And then of course, if shoppers can just be a tiny bit respectful of other people where if someone's getting the milk and you want milk too, you wait a second or two for them to step out of the way. You don't have to be right in their face to get the milk at the same time. And if people can just do those small things then you can really keep distance. And if you have masks plus distance, those two things especially in kind of a, a short time periods like you're gonna be doing while you're shopping are really, really low risk. It's really those circumstances where you get very close to people or you don't have masks on that are really high risk. And so I think those are the parts that if people can do that while they're shopping, they can keep themselves quite safe. Great, okay. That's the only thing I'd add, add is yeah. that 80 year olds should try to stay home. Um, mm, okay, so yeah. 
they should try yeah. to have other. And people. what about the farmers market? If you're, you know, in a high risk group or over eighty, could you maybe feel good about going to the farmers market to do it? We have a lot of markets. It depends. Um, outdoors is better than indoors generally, but um, standing in a line or running into friends and ch standing and chatting, those are uh, risky activities for an 80 year old. So um, our elders, um, we really need to care for them and keep them home as much as we can. Great, okay, all right. Um, and then we have two more questions before our lightning round. Uh, first for Erica. Um, we're wondering like what you're hearing from people, um, what information you're getting about if people are getting sick at work, how much um, workplace outbreaks are, are a part of uh, what's happening, especially in South County. And then are people having enough support, economic support to be able to stay home if, if they are sick or if they've been uh, exposed? Yeah, most of the, the stories we hear are around uh, um, parties and social gatherings, frankly, less around workplace. Um, there was a, a gathering and an employee was there, another employee was there and they all got sick together. Or oftentimes um, they share housing. I, I think I, I referenced the overcrowding conditions and oftentimes you do have uh, coworkers who share housing. And, and so that becomes uh, the way in which the virus is transmitted. Um, so in terms of your question about economic um, assistance. Um, it was great and it's been great to know that the county set up those hotels in, in Watsonville to support um, with uh, quarantining. Um, however, uh, what we do know is that uh, that means people that uh, would ultimately uh, be quarantined may not be able to access um, income uh, to meet their basic needs, their food and whatnot. Um, and that's been a challenge, frankly, especially for our farm working undocumented individuals. Uh, who right, right. Have, they don't have any other source of revenue uh, to lean on. Um, we suspect that some of them may be feeling sick and just not reporting it as a result, because uh, it's a matter of literally, do I put food on the table and do I eat or do I report that I'm sick? And, and, and we suspect that may be happening which is why we're making a plea uh, that we, we think out of the box and we figure out a way to provide some, some immediate financial assistance so that we can alleviate that financial stress uh, that we know may be um, a burden for some of our members of our community coming out and saying, I need, I need to quarantine and I'm okay with doing so because there's economic solvency. And I know there's been some program right. around that right now. It's all a matter of how do you connect people to, to that resource. And that's, that's posing some of some challenges as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and then we'll go to Chris, I think for one last of our panel question. Well, I, I think I'm <laughs> going to just sort of try to kick it off here for the lightning round, a ton of questions about okay. over 65. And uh, I mean, uh, we've, we've health systems seem to have differing uh, takes on this. Uh, Dr. Newell, but I guess based on what you're seeing now, what is the end date for everybody over 65 in Santa Cruz County to have their two their two shots that want them? Look into your crystal ball. Oh, sorry, you're muted. <laughs> our state, our state epidemiologist, who I trust very much and know, Dr. Erica Pan, um, made a public statement yesterday that if we move from here into our 65 plus, it will take the state through May to get that population vaccinated. And in Santa Cruz, we have 47,000 people who are 65 plus, and they each need two doses. That's 90,000 doses that we need, and we get about 2,000 doses a week. So that's most of a year. Thanks. So until we have adequate vaccine, um, the, it looks like this is going to be a very long drawn out process. Now, we, pre, our new president said he's going to make, uh, he's going to distribute 100 million vaccines in 100 days. That's great, but that's only a third of the country in the next three months, mm -hmm. 100, three plus months. So, um, you know, that's mm -hmm. only 70 or 90,000 people in Santa Cruz that are going to get the vaccine 
Um, so it's, uh, it's going to be a long drawn out process. Now, when you're talking about 2000 doses a week, is that just to the county or is that more of a general estimate based on the health systems too? Ah, that's just the county. Just the county. So, yeah. And then we would hope that the um, federal pharmacy partnership would step up their game. They're getting vaccine directly from the federal government to vaccinate our elders and other folks in residential care. Um, they're way behind their schedule and we have no idea how many vaccines they've given or what their plans are. And then uh, the multi-county entities get a, a slice of the state distribution as well. And then uh, there, is, uh, there are plans for the fourth leg of the stool. We keep talking about our four-legged stool now is um, that uh, other medical providers like our federally qualified health centers, our safety net clinics would get their own supply directly from the state. Um, we have yet to see that distribution plan working. So for now, they uh, get them through us at the county level. Okay. Okay. Mel, take it away with the lightning round. <laughs> okay, well, let's start because I know shorter. you want to. <laughs> well, that's important. And this is also a kind of overarching question. Um, so with these new rules that anyone over 65 is eligible technically, um, there were all these very detailed phases and tiers and stuff for California's vaccine plan. Are those all out the window? Are people still, like our teachers still up next? What's the deal? <laughs> Well, that declaration about 65 up and educators came from the last president. And so this mm -hmm. president may have a completely different set of priorities. And so mm -hmm. um, there's emergency meetings uh, being held by the national immunization um, uh, professionals next week to relook at okay. the phases. And then the state is also relooking at tiers, but the governor mm -hmm. told us earlier in the week that he would be moving to an age-based strategy because of our hospital surge and um, the okay. impact on our hospitals. Okay, so we need to stay tuned. Okay, um, and then next, how will people be notified to get the vaccine? Like, how do you get notified it's your turn where to sign up? Well, just today, the state told us that they would be unveiling a new app called My Turn. And I believe it's a joint cool. venture with Salesforce and um, anyone in California can sign up. And then when it's your turn, my turn, we'll let you know and uh, we'll direct <laughs> you to either your healthcare system or to another opportunity in your community. Okay, okay, great. Um, and so then people who are sort of independent, maybe in-home caregivers for high-risk people or independent uh, child care providers or they own a daycare, um, how will they, are they gonna get contacted through that app? Um, where do they sort of fit in to the, to the rollout? Yes, so currently they're in phase 1B, uh, the old phase 1B, but um, we don't know at this point. Okay. So we'll stay tuned for that, I guess. Um, do you have any sense of when that will be resolved? Like when the, the new guidelines and, and kind of the new tiers, if there are tiers, will be public? We were told that would be today, but it wasn't. Okay. <laughs> Soon then, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, all right. And then uh, one, this is maybe just related to the old tiers, but um, People who are higher education employees, UCSC and Cabrillo are, are the big ones here, of course. Um, are they included in the phase 1B, the old phase 1B education workers category or is that um, K-12? We don't know. That hadn't been completely fleshed out before it was abandoned. Um, so, but I know the governor is particularly interested in getting K, uh, transitional kindergarten through sixth grade open. So I would imagine that if he's going to prioritize educators that it will be for that um, level of classroom education, TK through six. Okay, okay. And then are people allowed to go to other counties to get vaccinated? Like say you're a member of Kaiser or, or you work in another county, like are there any situations where people can hop over to Santa Clara County and, and get a vaccine there? 
if your healthcare system directs you to go to another county to get your vaccine, um, and that is happening, um, then you should go wherever they tell you to go. But if you're relying on county vaccine, it will only be given in our county. You must get it from our county. Okay. So um, if you're a Kaiser patient, for example, and you call them, they may tell you that they have an opening in their San Jose Kaiser on, you know, next week and Wednesday and to be there at 11. But it, it just depends. Okay. Okay, great. Um, I know we're running up on our time limit here. Um, Chris, do we have time for a couple more questions or should we go to our sort of closing statements? Well, I think the last- There's a lot question, of questions. <laughs> I, think, I think we wanna, I think we'll throw one final question out to all three panelists and then we will uh, sort of wrap up here. But I think the question to all three panelists is, is, is there something about COVID right now that you think uh, the public doesn't know and absolutely needs to know? Or the effects of the pandemic. Uh, or the effects yeah, of the general. pandemic. Yeah. We can start with Erica maybe and then we can go around clockwise to Marm and then Newell. Dr. Newell. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about children and the impact of the pandemic and children, but do not underestimate the pressure that this is putting on many adults, the caregivers of these children as well. Mm -hmm. We are seeing that um, day in, day out. We often try to do family therapy whenever possible uh, because we do recognize that parents are under a lot of pressure themselves as well. Um, so I just want to highlight that so that we don't lose sight that it's not just the children and the youth. The parents are equally stressed and equally, some of them hanging by threads, just trying to understand how they can move mm -hmm. forward, be providers and teachers and caretakers and everything else. And as Dr. Newell said, We've been at this for almost a year. So it, it's, uh, it's been stressful to see the parents uh, do their best, but some of them are getting, are meeting their threshold uh, of patients. Mm. Let's not lose sight of the mental health needs of the uh, adult indigent population in our county. Mm. Thank you. Mark? Thanks, Erica. Thank you. Sure, I guess the thing that I think I would like everyone to know most is that um, we're in a situation now where I would consider it a race between how fast we can get people vaccinated and how fast the virus mm -hmm. is getting between us. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think I know <laughs> all of us are very, very, as uh, Erica just said, all of us are very much tired and struggling and the healthcare workers are tired and struggling. And, and I think that sometimes makes us want to either give up or to uh, toss away some of the measures we've been taking to see that friend or family we've been missing all this time. And that uh, I think say four months ago or five months ago when we didn't have vaccines to really like have the light at the end of the tunnel for us, maybe that was even harder. We didn't really see an end, an end date. Although the doctor Newell is correct that the end date isn't tomorrow. It's definitely still a few months away. There is this um, every few weeks we can basically put off the spread of the virus. We can get more people vaccinated and those people that get vaccinated will have a extremely small chance of getting sick and dying. And so if we can just push a couple more months um, uh, to basically keep ourselves safe and the people around us safe, we will prevent a huge number of deaths as well as um, illnesses that we unfortunately now know can have very, very long lasting effects. And so I think that's my biggest thing is that, uh, that, that there's light at the end of the tunnel and that we should do what we can now and maybe even double down on some of the things that we, um, uh, that we struggle with in terms of uh, social activities we'd like to engage in, things like that, um, and know that unfortunately there are even a few things pushing that race in favor of the virus a little bit. So these new variants and things like that that might be a little bit more mm -hmm. transmissible will make the race even harder for us mm -hmm. to win. And that means that we have to use our tools, which are basically our personal behavior that we have combined with um, the spaces and stuff that are around us. And that means employers providing safe workspaces. So if there are any listeners on the call today that are um, employers and, and are providing workspaces for their employees, if they can make those as safe as possible, um, basically if we can all, all provide each other with the support we need to make our interactions safe for the next few months, that can really save a lot of lives. And I hope that we can kind of do our best on that front. I hope so too. Thank you, Marm, that's great. Um, and then uh, Dr. Newell, we'll close with you. My best words of advice and that people may have forgotten are to stay home. <laughs> stay home, connect with your loved ones virtually, continue to be kind, be patient, 
and don't give up. Um, hope is on the horizon. All right, all right. Uh, that said, right. we had a ton of questions tonight. We've had a ton of questions. We're gonna try to save things in the chat and do the best we can. Obviously, there are a lot of very specific medical questions. It may be best for you to try to reach out to your medical professional with some of them, because I know they are beyond our reach here uh, with our medical minds at Lookout, of which Mallory is the best one, I might add. Um, but, Not uh, a medical mind, but I'm trying. <laughs> Also want to stress that this is going to be the first of a few community forums at the very least, and we're going to have more coming up soon. Um, obviously, you can find us at lookoutsantacruz.com. Sign up for our COVID PM newsletter by clicking on the newsletter center. And of course, text COVID to 831-508-7524. Um, there's going to be a special membership offer coming to all of you tomorrow uh, via email who attended tonight. And uh, that will include some of the takeaways from this event. So I uh, really wanna thank our sponsors, thank all of you for, for joining us and uh, especially to our panelists, um, Marm, Dr. Newell, Erica, it was a great discussion and, and boy, it could have gone on for about four or five hours. So I'm glad to see the community yeah. is so engaged. And just to our readers and listeners, I want you to know there was a lot of um, really specific vaccine questions that we got that, um, we can't really answer right now because just in the past couple of days, the, the vaccine guidelines, as, as Dr. Newell said, changed so much. So please keep a very close eye on lookout. We're gonna keep uh, keeping you updated on, on all the vaccination guidelines and, and where you'll fit into it. So thank you. Everyone stay home and have a safe night. <laughs> thanks to everybody, uh, especially thanks to our, our fine uh, Andrea uh, hanging in there. Yeah. And up with our our fast talking <laughs> yes <laughs> thank you thanks so much andrea and annabelle thank you very much <laughs> thank right. you yeah, thank you all all right and thanks everybody that in the community